build trust with your colleagues. Don't blindly go out and test them or give them a list of don'ts. Build a relationship with them. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the CyberWire's Hacking Humans podcast, where each week we look behind the social engineering scams, the phishing schemes, and criminal exploits that are making headlines and taking a heavy toll on organizations around the world. I'm Dave Bittner from the CyberWire, and joining me is Joe Kerrigan from the Johns Hopkins University Information Security Institute. Hello, Joe. Hi, Dave. we got some good stories to share this week, and later in the show, Carol Terrio returns. She's got a conversation with Javad Malik from Know Before. They're going to be talking about bad security training. Have you ever been to security training? We have. What's it been like for you? If you're like us, ladies and gentlemen, it's the annual compliance drill, a few hours of PowerPoint in the staff break room. Refreshments in the form of sugary donuts and tepid coffee are sometimes provided, but a little bit of your soul seems to die every time the trainer says, Next slide. Well, okay, we exaggerate, but you know what we mean. Stay with us, and in a few minutes, we'll hear from our sponsors at Know Before, who have a different way of training. All right, Joe, uh, let's go ahead and jump right into our stories this week. Uh, I'll kick things off for us. I have a story from Wired, uh, and it's titled, Deep Fakes Are Now Making Business Pitches. Uh, what? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um... A article by Tom Simonite. So we're familiar with deep fakes. Been out for a couple, well, a couple years now, I suppose, where yes. uh, folks can take uh, existing footage of someone and they can manipulate that footage to make it appear as though that person is saying something different than what they had originally said. Some of these can even generate new content. Right, right, and that's what we're getting at here. Uh, of course, uh, started out uh, as many of these things in technology do where people were applying it to pornography, you know, mm-hmm. applying celebrity faces to pornographic uh, scenes and so on and so forth. Right. Uh, well, in this case, uh, there is a company who is named uh, Synthesia, and they are offering a product of taking uh, deepfake technology and using it for business cases. So, for example... Uh, I could send out a custom email to uh, everyone on my potential customer list. Mm -hmm. And in that email, there is a video of me saying, uh, let's say I was sending it to you, and I would say, hello, Joe. Uh, I'm really happy to send you this email. I think this is a great product that you and your uh, friends at Johns Hopkins could uh, really benefit from, right? Right. Uh, So what this— In the video, you don't make a personalized video for everybody. Exactly. Right. 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 So the idea is uh, I record one video of myself, and then this system uses the deep fake to custom generate the fake video for everyone. And I suppose fake, I don't know, artificial, synthesized. Synthetic. (laughs) Synthetic Synthetic content is the the buzzword. (laughs) Right. 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 and, you know, it. so I have a couple of thoughts on this. Okay. First of all, um, I'm reminded of that old episode of The Simpsons where the kids go off to uh, Krusty Camp. Camp and, Krusty, yes. <laughs> right. Hail <laughs> to you, Camp Krusty. <laughs> right. And it I says, remember that episode well. And it says, uh, hey, kids, I'd like to introduce your camp counselor, <laughs> Mr. Black. <laughs> <laughs> so that that's kind of what's going on here, much more sophisticated than that. Right. Um and they have some demos on their website, the Synthesia people. And my take is it's not quite there yet. It's no. well, it's got that kind of um Uncanny Valley. There's I feel as though we're most of the way across the Uncanny Valley in terms of it making me uncomfortable the way the the person in the video looks. Right. It's more the cadence of the way they're talking. Mm -hmm. It's more, hello, Joe, how are you today? I'm so glad to see you. Here's something that I think you will find very beneficial. Right, they need to set the diction setting a little lower on that one. (laughs) Yeah, there's just something a little (laughs) bit off by it. Um, Yeah. Now, I'll say, I mean, I think this technology is very interesting. Um, We actually have access to it uh, at the CyberWire. We use a tool 
that um, we use for editing audio clips, um, and it does automatic transcription. And it has a function where I can go in and read a script, a a predetermined script, Mm -hmm. and based on that script, the system analyzes my voice and then can synthesize my voice with a high degree of accuracy. Right. And what's useful for that is, let's say I'm reading a daily news report for the CyberWire, and if I misspeak, if I say the wrong word, uh, it means my editors don't have to come back to me and say, hey, Dave, you knucklehead, you said this word wrong. Right. They could put the correct word in. Using AI. Using AI, it'll substitute that word in my own voice. Chances are... You know, a single word, a word or two, it's good enough smoke and mirrors, no one will ever notice. Right. It starts to break down if you try to do complete sentences. Yes. Because it doesn't have that special something, that secret sauce that is all of our personalities that we apply to to our speaking. It's just not Dave. It's just <laughs> not Dave. No, no. For for better or for worse. Uh, and and similarly, these folks, it's it's a pro- same sort of process. Uh, you sit down for about forty minutes reading a, a special script, uh, and then their algorithms analyze uh, everything that you say, and then you can basically have it say anything you want it to. So I don't, I I know I think this is interesting from a technology point of view. Um, I think it's interesting that people are trying to make business cases for this. Yeah. And I think they have made a business case for this. I don't know that it's something I would sign up for because my take is it's not quite there yet. Right. I think I think at this point it's something where you could get attention, you could get people to listen to your message just because it's a little bit different. It's a novelty. Yeah. Right? Exactly. It's a novelty. That's yeah, I, a, yeah. I see this quickly becoming something that we we are irritated that at least I'm irritated with. Oh, here's another deep fake <laughs> well, that but now, like, Joe, let's be fair. <laughs> you have a low threshold for irritation. Yes, I do. <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> Agreed. Yeah. Yeah. I think you're right. I think you're right. Why would this irritate you specifically? Uh mainly because just marketing irritates me to begin with. Yeah. Um, you know, I get I get Tons of marketing emails every day. Right. And uh, to the person who put me on the PR Newswire mailing list, thank you very much. <laughs> uh, I don't know who did that, but yeah. <laughs> I can't stand I get like eight of those every single day. Uh-huh. Um, and for some reason, I have a, I have a disdain for it. I have, and, and there are people I know, people whose names I see repeatedly in my inbox that I have resolved to never do business with. Uh, because of the number of emails they send me, it just bugs me. Mm-hmm. And I know that sounds petty and irritate and and maybe a little uh, grumpy old man about about things, <laughs> but it just uh, I don't know. And I, and this I can see this doing the same thing. Hello, Joe. Mm-hmm. I would like to talk to you about my product, and mm-hmm. you know it. Mm. Yeah. Well, I think that's part of the equation here too. Yeah. Is yeah. as a marketer, that's a line you have to balance. You right. Have, you have to walk that line between. Reaching out to people frequently and effectively, but uh, annoying them. Right uh, on the other side of that. Yeah, I'm so. all I'm all about advertising. I, I I'm not anti advertising, I, I but I think I am anti marketing. I, <laughs> maybe you know you know it, there's a difference, right? Yeah. Like sending me unsolicited emails, it bothers me. Of course, I I've said this before. Email's terrible. Anybody can send you anything. Right. Um. And if you don't have security or or protections in place. That includes malicious actors. If you go out and set up a mail server to receive mail, anybody can put something into it. And mm-hmm. that that's a holdover from the 60s, mm-hmm. the 1960s. That's that's how old email is. Yeah. Is it the 60s? Maybe the 70s. I don't know. Really long time ago right. in terms of the internet. Um, but it, yeah. <sighs> but I digress. Uh, <laughs> yeah. and, I mean, this is interesting. I think this is a really, really cool use of the technology. And and I don't doubt that that this company will do well. Because mm-hmm. I think that I think that other marketer people who people who are in marketing are going to think this is cool, this is new, this is interesting. I can reach a, a large audience with uh, with personalized messaging. Yeah, and maybe that has value. Yeah, I think it's also interesting that how readily this is available now. Yeah, it's not exotic. You know, you no. can go out and buy it, and it's affordable, and there are many applications for it. And I think as it continues to develop, and and um, if these, you know, I could see this becoming something that can be done in real time. Mm-hmm. So your your website chatbot uh, customer service rep isn't just going to be a text robot. It could be 
a face <laughs> yeah, staring that, back at you. That would be a good use of this, though. Mm. That I would not object to. Really? Um, yeah. Uh, it, if you could do AI tech support like this, mm-hmm. uh, at least tier one tech support, mm. right? I don't know that I'd object to that as much. Mm. Okay. You know, like if I could get, if somebody, a lot of these computers have webcams now, right? Or yep. they're built in. My computer at home, I actually have to plug a webcam into it yeah. because it's one I built and deliberately omitted a webcam. Uh-huh. Um, <laughs> But again, I, I digress. <laughs> but uh-huh. you know, if you're on if you're on a tech support issue, like let's say you're having problems with uh, your internet service provider, and instead of getting the annoying chat bot that, that walks you through things, you get a face um, of somebody who has licensed their image and mm-hmm. their voice, mm-hmm. and this image and voice walks you through tier one tech support, and then says, "Okay, I can't solve your problem," or maybe it does solve your problem, but I, I can't solve it. Let's to pass you on to tier two, which is an actual person. Mm-hmm. That would be a great use for this technology. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. Certainly more to come. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I think also just we need to be mindful of it that, that more to come, right? right? Yeah. <laughs> for, for better or for worse. All right, we'll have a link to that in the show notes. Again, it's uh, from the folks over at Wired, and uh, the article is titled Deep Fakes Are Now Making Business Pitches. That's my story this week. Joe, what do you have for us? Dave, last uh, last month, actually two months ago, as this podcast drops, in July, Proofpoint released their State of the Fish report. Mm. And we haven't talked about it in this show yet. We've mm-hmm. been a little remiss. <laughs> um, this is a good report. It, they do this annually. Yep. This year, the data comes from two surveys, one which was a survey of 3,500 working adults in seven countries, Mm -hmm. another survey that was 600 IT professionals in the same seven countries. Hmm. They also used their own data from 60 million simulated phishing attacks Hmm. and 15 million emails that were reported via their platform. So they have a lot of data to go through in this and to draw from, including those two surveys, which they go out and they uh, gather the information themselves. They actually contracted with a third party. Uh Uh-huh. Um, across the seven countries, 57% of organizations experienced a successful phishing attack. Hmm. So that, that means that a phishing attack came in and somebody took action on that phishing attack that they shouldn't have taken. Right. And of those who suffered the successful phishing attack, 60% of them lost data. Wow. 52% of them had accounts compromised. 47% had a ransomware infection. Yikes. Of some kind. 29% had a malware infection, some other malware that wasn't ransomware. Yeah. And 18% had experienced direct financial loss, like through wire transfer fraud or something Mm, like that. mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, there's a lot of overlap in that number, right, those numbers. So some of these companies experienced multiple types of these events. Right. Right. So it's even possible that one of these companies experienced all of these things, (laughs) which would be a bad day at that company. Yeah. A bad day at any company. Right. Right. Uh, So I feel for these guys. There's also significant regional differences in this data as well. Hmm. Uh, for example, 69% of Spanish participants from people from Spain reported experiencing data loss versus only 47% of Australian uh, respondents. Huh. I thought that was interesting. Yeah. Spear phishing and whaling attacks uh, versus business email compromise attacks. Spear phishing and whaling, they have in one category. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then business email compromise, they have another category. They're about the same at... Uh, at 66 and, and 65%. Okay. I, I think these numbers are low. Hmm. Because uh, what they're asking is they're saying some – these – in this survey, they asked people, and this was their response, 65% said, oh, yes, we have been hit by a business email compromise attempt or a uh, spear phishing or whaling attack. I think that there are companies out there – that don't know they're being targeted by these. Mm. I think that a significant portion of that 35% is is actually attacked. Well, I also think that they're unwilling to admit that they've been attacked. It could be that they're unwilling to admit it. It could be that they uh it could be that they don't know that it happened. Mm-hmm. Or it could be that um that they were actually attacked, but they were protected by their technology. Mm. Yeah. Um, yep. So there there's a number of possibilities, but I think that number is low. I I don't think Anybody should take solace in the fact that, oh, see, only, only two-thirds of companies are targeted by this. I think, I think 100% <laughs> of companies are targeted. That's cold comfort. Right. Yeah. Is, yeah. Jeez. <laughs> only two-thirds of the homes in my block have been broken into. Right. Uh, <laughs> it's great. Hey, I, there's a one-third chance that won't happen to me. Yeah. Hmm. Here's something interesting. Attacks over, over social media 
61% of the companies reported experiencing attacks over social media. What does that mean? What's an what's attack over social media? That like, just means the vector of attack is, is, happens uh, via social media. So okay. it could be over Facebook. It could be over LinkedIn gotcha. or Twitter. Somebody could uh, click on a link that's malicious or be sent an attachment that's uh, not bona fide. I see. Uh, the same with smishing. I hate that term, by the way, smishing. <laughs> that's just sending people text messages. Right. Uh, 61% uh, were targeted by that. Phone scams and vishing, uh-huh. another term I hate. Uh, <laughs> but uh, it, 54% of these companies reported being targeted by phone scams. People okay. People calling in trying to get information or, or trying to get people to do things. Uh, this is interesting, Dave. Malicious USB drops. Take a guess at what was reported as people, what percentage of businesses reported being attacked by a malicious USB drop? Oh, my goodness. I mean, that seems so old school to me, like obvious. Right. Uh, oh, I'm going to say 10%. 54%. <laughs> Holy smokes. That, really? Yeah, that surprised me. 54%? That surprised me for a couple of reasons. One, it, it is an old school attack, yeah. like you say. But that means somebody had to go to these organizations and drop USB. This is an expensive attack, speaking right. relative to a phishing attack. A right. phishing attack is almost free. This requires time and money to go <laughs> and do. I'm imagining, you know how when uh, they go, or like around you know where you and I live in the wintertime, we get snow sometimes, mm-hmm. and they have those trucks that go around spreading salt. Yes. And they have like a, a motorized spreader on the back that just... <laughs> Just sprays salt all over the road in the parking lot. Envisioning that with USB sticks. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Somebody just cruising around parking lots, spraying USBs all over the place. Uh, Let's get back to the phishing and to the simulated attack data that comes from Proofpoint's products. Yeah. Right? This is Proofpoint's own data. They get uh, the overall failure rate. When they're talking about failure rate, this is actually, you can think of it as like the phishing success rate. Okay. So it's the the employee's uh, failure rate. Guess the overall failure rate for uh, phishing emails. 20%. 20%, you say? I say 20%, and I'm just thinking of, because in our own organization, we use uh, phishing simulations. Mm -hmm. And so when someone fesses up (laughs) and says, oh, I fell for one, because, you know, they're they're effective. Yeah, it happens. You know, uh, and these are not dumb people. Right. Um, That's... That's important to note. Yeah. Uh, so I'm just trying to sort of think about how often it, it you know, it happens. So well, I got, I'm, I'm going to say 20%. I have good news, Dave. Yes. It's it's 11%. Okay. And that is actually down from last year at 12%. Okay. So that's good news. Headed in the right direction. Heading in the right direction here. Okay. We're, good. we're making progress. You and I have been screaming into the void long enough. People are starting to listen. <laughs> right. They simulate phishing attacks with three different types of attacks. One is just a URL that you have to click. Yeah. Right. Another one is uh, has a URL, but actually actually asks you to enter information. Okay. Uh, which so it's a two step process, and the third is a malicious attachment. Mm-hmm. Of those three, which do you think had the highest success rate? <sighs> Boy, that's a good question. I because I can see. I'm going to say the middle one, the login one, is the lowest. Ah, because you are it's, correct. Because it's multiple steps. That's right. But I'm a little torn between. Clicking a link because it's so easy to do, Mm -hmm. but a malicious attachment, if someone says, oh, here's a PDF, I could see people saying, oh, PDF, that's benign. I'll just, what's this say, you know? Uh, So I don't know. I'm split between the two. Which one is it? It's a malicious attachment, Dave. Hmm. And there's your 20%. 20% of those are successful. Huh. Right? Wow. But uh, in the data, only 9% of the phishing simulations are with with a fake malicious attachment. Okay. So, uh, but when they're sent, they're successful 20% of the time. Clicking on the link is uh, 12%. And clicking on the link and adding information, you're 100% correct. Because that's two steps, that's 4%. Ah. 4% of those are successful. Okay. There Hmm. is a ton of information in this report. And because of time, we can't go into the whole thing. I may do another episode on this. Okay. Because there's a lot of stuff in here to talk about. This is a good report. We'll put a link in the show notes. Uh, They want some uh, contact information to get it, but... I think they're owed that for this report. It's a good a good report. All right, good. All right, well, as you say, we'll have a link to that in the show notes. It is time to move on to our catch of the day. Dave, our catch of the day comes from a listener named Henning who writes, Hello, I love your podcast. A friend of mine got a PGP verified message on Discord 
with mountains of indisputable proof, and he sends screenshots. Dave, I think this is the first time we've had a um, a Discord catch of the day. I think that's right. Uh, before we begin this, I, I want to say that I, I should explain what a Carter is because this is a a an email alleging to be or a message, not an email, but a Discord message alleging to be from a Carter. And in uh, in black markets on the on the dark web or even on the open web, a Carter is someone who deals in stolen credit card numbers. So they they uh, they have either breached them themselves uh, or they've collected them from other people who breach them, and then they're out there bro- uh, brokering these deals. So Dave, why don't you uh, read to us this Discord message that this guy received? All right, it goes like this: I'm a Carter and reputable darknet vendor, very high rep on Empire and DNM, PGP verified. <laughs> this is your only invitation. Truly research this offer; it'll change your life. Online carding is when you buy hacked fish credit card details for $10 to $20 via auto shops, JSTash, Fish Shop, Yale Lodge, etc., and use it to place big orders on web stores like Amazon, Best Buy, etc. <laughs> what I do is simple. I provide a mentorship where I will one-on-one walk you through making thousands per week via defrauding Amazon. This is 100% digital. What I'm about to show you will be heavily substantiated with mountains of indisputable proof. <laughs> Legit, over 1,600 plus positive rep on Empire, Omniscient. Teaching carding since 2017, students follow guidelines when vouching that provide absolute proof that their success is real and current. All students make over $3,500 per week from this, some nearing $6,000 safety. Any associated risk of being caught will be methodically eliminated through proper digital OPSEC procedures. These will be explained in detail as many people hold a false narrative that anything online can or will be traced back to you. Well, that's the end of the conversation. Then this guy goes on to uh, post a bunch of links and videos uh, to convince the person to click on some of them or maybe to join that. I don't know what the end game here is. Uh, maybe the links are malicious. I, I certainly wouldn't click on any link that anybody sent me with this kind of thing in Discord. Right. Uh, it could also be that this guy is just another scammer uh, who's trying to trying to get people to uh, you know pay him for allegedly teaching them how to be a carter. Right. Uh, there, when you're doing this kind of criminal activity, <laughs> there is no way to totally eliminate the risk. You are taking a risk. Right. Uh, it uh, reminds me of, you know, those things you used to see in the back of magazines and comic books that right. said, you know, send twenty nine ninety five <laughs> right. for this plan on how to make money through mail order. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's like, Put it out in the back of a comic book that charges people twenty nine ninety five. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> works I mean, for me. This person, whoever they are, at the outset just says, We're we're crooks. We're <laughs> we're defrauding Amazon. Uh join us. Right. Profit. Yep. Mm. Wow. <laughs> so I thought this was a great one. It's, thank you for sending it to us, Henning. All right. Yes, thank you very much. That is our Catch of the Day. Of course, we would love to hear from you. If you have a Catch of the Day for us, you can send it to us at hackinghumans at thecyberwire.com. And now back to that question we asked earlier about training. Our sponsors at Know Before want to spring you from that break room with new school security awareness training. They've got the world's largest security awareness training library, and its content is always fresh. Know Before delivers interactive, engaging training on demand. It's done through the browser and supplemented with frequent simulated social engineering attacks by email, phone, and text. Pick your categories to suit your business, operate internationally, Know Before delivers convincing, real-world proven templates in 24 languages. And wherever you are, be sure to stay on top of the latest news and information to protect your organization with Know Before's weekly Cyber Heist News. We read it, and we think you'll find it valuable, too. Sign up for Cyber Heist News at knowbefore.com slash news. That's K-N-O-W-B-E, the number four, dot com slash news.
All right, Joe, it is always a pleasure when Carol Terrio joins us on our show. She always brings us interesting interviews with interesting people. And today is no exception. Uh, she recently spoke with Javad Malik from Know Before. And uh, they came at this from an interesting perspective. They're sharing thoughts on bad security training. Here's Carol Terrio. So we are here today with Javad Malik. He is a security awareness advocate at Know Before. Javad, thank you so much for coming on the show. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you for inviting me. Well, I'm so glad you're here because you know your cybersecurity onions, especially when it comes to training employees. So I thought you could help us understand how not to train people. So there have been a number of things in the press, haven't there, about bad training? Yes, there have. There have been some unfortunate incidents where people have sent out some some training campaigns and they've not been received very well at all. And it's it's had the opposite effect. It's, it's actually enraged people and they've uh, come out with pitchforks against the security teams. Just a few months ago uh, at a newspaper in the, in the States where during a very tough year of COVID, uh, they, they decided it would be a good idea to fish the employees with um, a 10,000 bonus after having laid off several people as well. So it was probably not the best time to do it. Although, in fairness, it's like it's exactly what the bad guys would do. But I think when you catch people out without building a relationship with them, without letting them know that this is the kind of stuff we do, and it's just a ha-ha gotcha, or, that, or if you, that's how you leave people feeling, then there's going to be a bit of resentment. Yeah, so you've got the IT people who are working internally who are mandated to lock down or educate employees in order to try and protect the environment. And I get that they are, you know, uh, scrambling around trying to find cool ways to do that. But at the same time, yeah, you don't want to be tricked, do you? If you don't know and you, and you get duped, it kind of sucks. Exactly. Yeah. You need to think about how people feel at the end of the training. If, if they feel like they've been tricked or duped or, they, or they're just made to feel stupid, then <laughs> they'll get a new job. <laughs> they'll get a new job. It, I, I, I liken it to a bit like training in a, in a gym, like sparring. Boxers will spar in a in a gym, and yeah. they'll have really good camaraderie about it. But mm. the same person, you punch them in a restaurant in the face, and their reaction will be very, very different. So create that safe environment <laughs> where they're accepting of that. Okay, so maybe you can share with us, I don't know, three top things that you should never, ever do during a cybersecurity training. Because some people out there don't have the resources to go third party, and they're trying to do it on their own. And maybe we can provide them a bit of guidance on what to avoid. Okay, so three top tips. And it's really difficult to distill it into three, but I'll try my best. You can go to four or five if you want. No, no, no. I'll, I'll, I'll stick to three. <laughs> Number one most important thing I, is if you're the security team, build trust with your colleagues. Don't blindly go out and test them or give them a list of don'ts. Build a relationship with them. If if their first interactions with you when they join the organization are um, are, are negative or the only time they see or hear from you is when you tell them, no, don't go ahead with that, or you've done something stupid, uh, they're not going to react well to anything, no matter how well intended it may be. Okay, good point. Mm. The second thing, and I'm happy to see it's, it's reduced a bit over the years, but it still happens enough to be a mention, is don't name and shame people or make them feel like they've done something wrong if they make a mistake. We we need to recognize mm. that security isn't these people's day jobs. They don't do it day in, day out. They might get an email and they might click on the link. They might tell someone their credentials over the phone. They might do a whole bunch of things. As security professionals, your job isn't there to berate them, to make them feel like 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 they've done something wrong. But, you know, just work with them, tell them this stuff happens help them get better. I remember this campaign. It was at a very big bank in the UK. And so they did some phishing training. I don't remember exactly how they did it. But the next morning when employees came in, there were two colored balloons on everybody's desk. So whatever, let's say it was red or white. And then it turned out that an email came from IT saying, everybody with a red balloon, you know, failed the phishing test. What do you think about That's that? That's horrible. You're just making people feel horrible. And you know, what, why are you highlighting that? Why are you trying to make people feel less about themselves? Instead, have a leaderboard up there that shows, you know, maybe once a quarter, you send out an email saying so-and-so, these people have spotted legit phishing or they've never filed for a test. So you reward the positive. 
And that's something people can be proud of. So you're not explicitly calling out people saying, oh, they all failed or they're no good or what have you. But then people are like, oh, you know, I feel good about that. The security team t- treats me with respect. Mm. As a father of four, um, you know, you know that if you point out people and you to the kids and you say that you're bad at this, you're useless at that, it destroys their self-esteem. And then, you know, they, they stop caring about trying to do the right thing because they're like, well, whatever I do, it's not good enough for dad anyway. Yeah, I'd listen to anyone who had four kids and was alive. (laughs) And what about your third tip? My third tip is don't make it boring. There's a tendency for training material to bore people to tears. Mm. We we get people into organizations and when they join, it's normally, hey, meet all the departments, here's security. And security takes them into a, a meeting room for 45 minutes and goes death by PowerPoint saying, you will not share your passwords. You will not let someone tailgate you and you will. It's a whole list of don'ts. It, it sounds yeah. really, really boring. And it, it, it does. And people forget it the minute they leave. And then maybe they'll repeat it mm. once a year. So don't bore them with that. Create content that is um, interesting, engaging, and short and memorable. And then repeat that frequently throughout the year. So, you know, it, it, don't focus on trying to boil the ocean. Just pick one or two behaviors you think are the most risky for your organization. Work on those. Um, uh, have it as a as a training module. Have it as a, a poster have it as um, something that appears on your screensaver or your mouse mount, whatever it might be. Uh, and, and just like make it short and fun and repeatable and those messages will sink in. Think of it a bit like a marketing campaign as opposed to a education campaign. Brilliant advice, Javad Malik, security awareness advocate, new before. Thanks so much. Thanks. All right, uh, Joe, what do you think? Dave, I have a saying. <laughs> yes. Anything that can be done can be done poorly. Ah. <laughs> it's, are it's you a, are you a, an a object a lesson in that? Or are you a, <laughs> no, well, a story? I have object lessons uh, from my career a, in a that. A hard learned uh, th- yeah. part of your life? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I'll tell you, Dave, when I'm in a job interview and somebody says, tell me about a project that went terribly, terribly wrong. Yeah. I have a story for that. Okay. <laughs> Right. How much time do we have? No, it's uh, I can't tell that story now. Maybe maybe some other time. I mean, in the interview, you say to the person, right. how, much how much time, time do, do you oh, okay, have? Yes. yes. It's a very funny story. It's a great, All right. it's awesome. Training with a fish about a bonus after laying people off is something that the bad guys would do. Yeah. Uh, Javad is 100% correct about that. But there are some things that we as good guys should just let bad guys do and not try to emulate it. Right. Right. I've thought about this a lot. You know, there, there are all kinds of things that these guys do. There are things that we should not do. There are lines that we should not cross on the good, good guy side of the house. <laughs> right, right. Right. It's like burning somebody's house down to convince them that they should have had sprinklers. Right. So, exactly. You know, I, I was thinking about this and it yeah. reminds me of an episode of SpongeBob SquarePants, okay. I, which, is, which is one of the best cartoons ever. Yeah. Uh, there's one where he becomes a hall monitor and then he becomes really, uh, overtly security conscious and there's a scene where he, where he's those those people are inside their house and they left their window open so he jumps in as the open window maniac to teach them a lesson right, <laughs> right. that's not effective yeah right yeah it doesn't help yeah uh, <laughs> you need to think about how people are going to feel when this is done and this is why the title of Christopher Hadnagy's latest book ends with the phrase and leave them better off for having met you mm-hmm. that that's important I agree. Yeah. I like Javad's top three tips here. Number one, build trust and rapport. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would add that make sure that every every employee in your organization feels like they're part of the security team. Do whatever you have to do to communicate that to them, that you're, you know, that you that this is a two-way conversation. I'm not just telling you what you're going to do, you're going to tell me what you're seeing. That's very important for me. I need to have visibility into the organization and you are my eyes and ears. Right. Uh, do not name and shame. Uh, when somebody falls for a fish, they have been attacked. If your risk model does require disciplinary action, uh, which not a lot of risk models do, but some of them do, yeah, uh, do that in private. Handle that privately. Mm. Never name and shame. This story that Carol told about the bank with the with the balloons mm-hmm. that did not leave people feeling better. Yeah, I mean, even if you pass that fish test, the fact that that your peers were all shamed publicly that way. And and Javad says that's horrible. I agree 100%. That's that's horrible implementation of this. Yeah. Um, and three, don't bore people. And this is kind of 
a challenge in our industry, I think. Yeah, you know, we like to stand up there. This is the stuff we live and breathe every day, mm-hmm. right? We mm-hmm. love it, and that's why we do it. But everybody else doesn't do do it that way. They have, everybody else sees it differently. They have their jobs to do. They're focused on their tasking. Right. I say there are three things you can do to help implement this. Number one, be inclusive. Like I say, make everybody think that they're part of your security organization or, or actually make them be part of your security organization. Yeah. That's important. Not make them think it. Make it so that, so that is the case. Number two, rather than a one-hour video every year or training session every year, break it up into five to ten minutes every month. Mm-hmm. This does two things. The higher frequency keeps it top of mind, and the shorter duration prevents it from uh, pre- prevents people from losing attention. Right. Uh, additionally, five minutes a month is the same training as one hour a year. Yeah. Right? It's the yeah. same training time. So I say try to make it more continuous mm-hmm. rather than something that you do once a year that has to be done. And, and three, have relatable stories. Have relatable stories about this because that's, that's how we work with uh, – Perry Carpenter is big on this. He talks about ha- uh, storytelling. Yeah. And, yeah. And that's, that's really important that – because that's how we evolve. We evolve with oral tradition and, and things like that. And storytelling is remarkably powerful. Yeah. So if you can develop relatable stories that you can deliver once a month in five to ten minutes and make everybody feel inclusive, I, uh, included, I think that goes a long way towards building a better security posture. Yeah, I'll, I'll also add to make sure that you tell the, the whole story as to why this is necessary for the organization. You know, it's – it's. And and I what I mean by that is not only is it important for the organization in terms of everybody knowing this information and and having it top of mind and being part of the security team, but it's also uh, important for organizations to uh, be able to say that they're training everyone, that all of our employees have done this. Right. That this is a sort of a take one for the team kind of thing. And I think lots of people overlook that. They, they may think to themselves, I don't – I know this stuff. Why do I – you know, I know this stuff. Right. Like, yeah, you may know this stuff, but if we can check you off the box and we can do it and it only takes five or ten minutes of your time, right. that you're contributing to the bigger picture of the whole company being able to say honestly that every employee does this. And so, you know, here's here's how we can demonstrate it's important to us. Right. Yeah. All right. Well, our thanks to Carol Terrio for uh, bringing us that uh, interview with Javad Malik from Know Before. We do appreciate it. And we want to thank our sponsors, Know Before. They are the social engineering experts and the pioneers of new school security awareness training. Be sure to take advantage of their free phishing test, which you can find at knowbefore.com slash fish test. Think of Know Before for your security training. That is our show. We want to thank all of you for listening. And of course, we want to thank the Johns Hopkins University Information Security Institute for their participation. You can learn more at isi.jhu.edu. The Hacking Humans podcast is proudly produced in Maryland at the startup studios of Data Tribe, where they're co-building the next generation of cybersecurity teams and technologies. Our senior producer is Jennifer Iben. Our executive editor is Peter Kilpie. I'm Dave Bittner. And I'm Joe Kerrigan. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.